I want to welcome you all uh, to um, this breakout session, Parenting with a Disability. Um, I'm Karen Nakamura. I'm the Robert and Colleen um, Haas Chair in Disability Studies. I'm one of the Haas Institute um, faculty. Um, and first I want to um, acknowledge um, that um, this event is taking place on traditional Ohlone land and that we recognize the continued importance um, to them Ohlone people. Um, and so uh, we are still in a state of, of occupation. Um, so this uh, session emerged out of a um, briefing paper that um, uh, three scholars in the Haas Institute uh, wrote. Um, and it's the one that I passed out. It's also at the back table. If you want to take extra ones, um, please do. Um, and so uh, it's called State of Change, State Level Actions to Protect the Rights of Parents with Disabilities and Their Children. And it was written by three, um, three of the Haas Institute um, scholars. Um, Ella Callow, who is sitting to my immediate right. Um, uh, she is currently UC Berkeley's um, new um, um, ADA and 504 compliance officer. We're very happy that she just joined us um, um, at Berkeley. Before that, she was um, in a similar position with the city of Berkeley. And then um, before that, and most relevant to um, the briefing document is that she was the director of the legal program um, for the National Center for Parents with Disabilities and the Families in uh, Berkeley, California. That was associated with uh, Through the Looking Glass. And Ella's work uh, within um, um, the National Center for Parents with Disabilities and their families was really critical. Um, they wrote a um, highly influential piece called um, Blocking the Cradle, which is about um, the um, rights or the lack of rights that parents um, with disabilities have in, in trying to keep and maintain the families. Um, the second author of the briefing document is Sue Schweik, Susan Schweik, who's a professor at UC Berkeley. That's S-U-S-A-N-S-C-H-W-E-I-K. I apologize for uh, not spelling them. Um, um, and um, the third, and, and unfortunately, Professor Schweik couldn't be here today, so she sends her regrets. Um, Sue Schweik is um, uh, um, the core, really, of the Disability Studies Program at Cal, the author of a highly influential book called The Ugly Laws, which looks at how various laws that forbid the public display of disability and sort of other um, um, uh, um, debilitated statuses um, were, have been and are currently still present in the U.S. and, and are used as ways to outlaw um, homelessness, uh, um, uh, anti-vagrancy, and other ways that disparately impact both people of color, um, poor people, and disabled people. Um, so Professor Schweik sends her deep regrets. Um, the third author of the briefing paper, who is here, um, is Lucy uh, Siriani, who's a doctoral candidate and graduate student instructor in the English department at UC Berkeley. Um, her last name is S-I-R-I-A-N-N-I. -N -N -I. And she's writing her dissertation on 19th uh, century women's anti-racism poetry. And she's taught a variety of courses on social justice and minority literature. Um, so, uh, that really fulfills my role, um, which is to introduce these really fantastic um, um, folks to introduce this panel. Um, and then if you didn't get a copy of this, or if you want to take them ho um, copies of these home to spread to your constituents, um, I should mention that uh, Ella and Lucy are about to leave next month to go to Washington uh, to actually deliver copies of this briefing paper um, to members of Congress. Um, we're really hoping to have a national level influence on, on discussion of how we can protect the rights of, of disabled parents so that they can um, continue to raise their children um, 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 at home. Okay, so, Ella and Lucy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Karen. And um, we really, really appreciate the intro and the inspiration and the opportunities, always. Um, so we're going to share, we're going to go back and forth with our slides, and I'm going to start us off. Can you is, that, is, that, is that loud enough? Can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to scoot up a little bit here. Ah, there we go. That's better. Thank you. Okay. So... 
Karen introduced the report that we created together with Sue Schweik, Professor Schweik, State of Change. And as she mentioned, on May 14th, we'll be presenting this report um, that's seen there on the left of the screen. It's an image of a, of a mother who's a wheelchair user um, or a caretaker who's a wheelchair user embracing a child. And they're both African American and the boy is smiling. Um, and we're going to be producing that for members of Congress and speaking about it at the Congressional Caucus on Foster Children, Foster Youth Dinner in Washington, D.C. The Congressional Caucus provides a forum for members of Congress to discuss and develop policy recommendations to strengthen the child welfare system and to improve the overall well-being of youth and families in the United States. It's a bipartisan caucus, um, uh, probably one of the few bipartisan things actually still functioning in DC. Um, and it includes uh, the leadership of Karen Bass, who is a California rep, uh, very influential in this field, Representative Tom Marino, um, Jim Langevin, who is actually working on many disability issues, but particularly focused on looking at parents' with disabilities right now. Um, and uh, other people from different regions, um, Bacon, Lawrence, Black, and Mitchell representing the Northeast, the Southwest, and the Midwest. Why? Um, why is this topic important enough to merit the time and attention of our elected officials, of our national resources, um, especially in a period when there are so many issues before them and when most people probably have never really been presented with the issue of parents with disabilities. Well, in the United States, according to the American Community Survey, 6.2% of parents raising children under the age of 18 identify as having a disability. So that's a substantial population. And almost 10% of our American children under 18 are being raised by disabled parents. So 10% of all kids have a parent with a disability. 13.9% of American Indian Alaskan Native parents have a disability. That's the highest rate in the country. Um, Native people in all colonialized nations tend to have the highest level of disability, both as a result of poverty and of the ravages of colonialization in all its forms. Similarly, 8.8% of African American parents have a disability. Also, we see this as tied to the uh, history of slavery and oppression, as well as poverty in this country. 6% of white parents, 5.5% of Latino Hispanic parents, and 3.3% of Asian Pacific Islander parents identify as disabled. The final reason is that at some level we all understand that what is at stake is the veracity of our national commitment to disability human rights. The real integration of people with disabilities into the human family depends on the idea that we allow them to be both descendants and to become ancestors in the human family, in the American family. And the fact is that it was both government together wedded with academics that created the eugenics movement in this country, and it will have to be government wedded together with academics that is going to help to address and create reparation for what has occurred over the hundred years since those policies were affected. So I have this title that is Children's Stories, Legal Stories, Intersection Stories because these are stories from the work that I did when I was running the National Center for uh, Parents with Disabilities and Their Families Legal Program. We would take callers from all over the country with federal funding from the National Institute on Disability Rehabilitation and Research. And those parents, for free, would receive technical assistance and support to themselves and to their attorneys as they went through legal cases where their parenthood of their child was being challenged on the basis of their disability. Either in the child welfare court, which is where a social worker and the state come in and say that you're unfit, you're either abusing or are neglectful of your child, or in the child custody family cases where two parents or a parent and a caregiver are arguing over custody of a child in the family court. For most of the parents that we talked to over the 10, 12 years that I did this work, um, 
only a portion of them were actually even alleged by the state to be abusive or neglectful. A vast majority of them were alleged to be negligent by virtue of their disability, i.e., they were an existential threat to the child, that they could become unfit or negligent in some manner because of the disability. They're legal stories, obviously, because they're happening in court cases. And they're intersection stories because most of the people that we deal with are poor in these cases, and because they include identities that other people traditionally in multiple arenas in the United States. So the first case is the case of Veronica. Veronica was a seven-year-old Winnebago tribal member. She was living in Wisconsin in an urban area with her mother. Her mother was identified as someone who had intellectual disability, and she did. Her and her mother had been living in a supported care facility that was kind of unique. It allowed people to, who had intellectual disabilities to live in apartments, in an apartment building, but they had personal attendant services that were facilitated for them, and they had someone on call on site who could assist them if something happened that was a challenge for them. Her mother worked part-time at a Walmart, and they had been living there since Veronica was born. The father had not been in the family uh, home ever, and mother had not had a relationship with father since before Veronica was born. Social services was contacted by the, um, by the owner of the facility because it came to their attention that one of the personal attendants and mom were spending more time sort of hanging out and chatting than really paying attention to the child. Someone complained of this. Social services came in and began doing evaluations of mom and child and determined that because mom had had turnover in her personal attendant staff, because this personal attendant had not been um, as good as previous personal attendants, and because mom would be unlikely to help the child with math in the coming years, that she wasn't an optimal placement and that they should instead place the child with dad. They contacted dad and began facilitating a relationship of meetings and um, supervised visitation. Mom was very against this because they didn't know him, really. Um, they arranged to then start having the child do sleepovers. Mom objected because when the child came home, she said the child didn't seem OK, and that she began having reactions to things like bathing that she had never had before, reactions to sleeping in the dark she had never had before. No one listened to mom. We got involved and uh, you know, made the argument that children are raised with the help of staff all the time, and there's staff turnover all the time. I was a young attorney at the time, and I would argue, you know, in the Bay Area, there's nannies and tutors, and there's constant staff turnover. Who cares? Uh, they would tell me it's not the same. It's not the same. It wasn't the same because they were poor and they were Indian, basically, mm -hmm. and disabled. Um, Eventually, the child came home with um, obvious signs of a physical assault, um, a sexual physical assault. We had gotten the local uh, Native American legal services involved, and they, with the criminal prosecution of father, were able to stop the social service intervention. But by this time, Veronica's mother was so scared and untrusting of authority that she took Veronica and she ran. So we don't know what happened to the family. We don't know what happened to Veronica. We don't know what happened to her mother. We know it's unlikely that Veronica got treatment for her trauma um, or that mom had a stable living situation for her as she had previously. Um, but that is the Veronica's story of uh, her and a father she did not need and that was being foisted on her simply because her mother had a disability. I can't go into that much detail, but I'm going to run through the next few cases with you. Marquez was a two-year-old African-American boy. His mother had cerebral palsy and was living in rural Georgia. When they contacted our program, mom was very upset because they had taken Marquez from her because she had cerebral palsy. But the only services that they gave was that once a week, he would be brought to her house by a middle-aged white social worker who would feed him, play with him, and do developmental floor time with him, and then take him away again. We were able to become involved in the case and um, require that the state provide some sort of reasonable reunification services for mom, but the state argued that they didn't have anything like that that was already available in their area, and so they shouldn't be required to provide it. 
Marquez was adopted by the white couple that had been fostering him um, with the only reunification services ever provided being that middle-aged white woman that came and played with him in front of his mother once a week for six months. Um, Layla and Asa were twin girls. They were six years old. Their mother was blind and they were in California up north in a rural area. Um, they lived in an apartment complex, the center of which was like a park area, a play area, and the kids would all play there and then come back upstairs to their parents. Parents watched them out the window. Um, she wasn't, um, she was legally blind, and because of this, a neighbor called and complained that she shouldn't let her children play there because she couldn't see them through the window. A social service person came to investigate, a social worker came to investigate and told her that, that this was problematic, that she wasn't properly supervising her children. Um, she agreed she wouldn't do it anymore. Um, they then decided that they needed to do further investigation and told her that her husband drank too much. She said that she would divorce him um, and he left. They, he agreed to leave immediately rather than let the girls be lost to this, you know, to this investigation. Um, they said that still wasn't sufficient. She agreed to move home to her parents' house, and her parents said they would help her, and she did move home, and they still took the girls away. They were placed with an upper middle class family in the area, and a lot was made of the fact that they were taken to church regularly and that they had writing lessons. Um, eventually, we did get these kids home, but only after she, uh, the mom did a magazine article about her case in which she discussed her case and the local district attorney prosecuted her for being in violation of a local county rule and California rule that you can't disclose information about a child welfare case. And so she was then arraigned on criminal charges. We brought in a pro bono attorney. She almost went to jail. They finally dropped the case against her after a great deal of work, and eventually she did get the kids back. Um, Charlie was taken from his grandmother, who was a caregiver, and this was in... Okay. Charlie was taken from his grandmother, who had been his caregiver since birth, um, we don't know how they found out about Charlie. His grandmother had arthritis, and he was two. It was his second birthday. They let him stay until he, his second birthday. Um, and then the social service took him away. Um, the only reason that he was taken was because he would be better off with a younger, able-bodied family. He was put in social services where he promptly had his foot broken and ended up in the hospital. He was in the hospital for a couple months, eventually, for various injuries. Um, she was never allowed to visit him, and according to the nurses, nobody else did either. He would allow, be allowed visitations with his grandmother when he was then um, in foster care placement, but these were ended because she brought him a marshmallow peep, and she had been told not to give him candy. Um, Charlie was eventually adopted by a couple who agreed to do an open adoption so that they could have letters back and forth with grandma and send pictures. And they told her that he, um, that they adored him and they loved him, but that he had a lot of behavioral problems, that he had signs of aggression and depression, and that he was scared of small, pa small spaces and was claustrophobic and would panic. They think that it was probably because he was left in cribs and in the hospital was left in a covered crib for his safety so he didn't climb out um, when he was left for long periods by himself. Um, I don't think I have time to go into the last one, so I'm going to leave that one. Um, but these are the types of stories that happen over and over and over and over. So you have these repeated themes of poverty, disability, um, oppression of people because they are outside of the system in too many ways to retain their rights to their children. So thank you so much for sharing those stories, Ella. And I want to speak a little bit about my own personal story and um, how the state of affairs currently is affecting the disability community as a whole, as current parents, as future parents. So um, I don't know if Ella can get the slide up. Um, I couldn't resist putting a picture of myself with my nieces, um, my cute little four and six year old nieces. So for anyone who can't see the picture, they're sitting on my lap and we're all just snuggling and looking very happy. Um, and I share that picture because I love kids. I've always cared for kids. I've worked with kids and I've always had such a strong desire to be a mother. And as 
much as anyone can be who is childless, I feel confident that I would be a loving and capable parent. But I don't feel confident that I will be allowed to do that um, as a woman who happens to be blind. Um, and it affects so many of my life decisions. You know, where will I live? Um, we'll talk about this much more later, but currently 33 state laws list disability as grounds for termination of parental rights. So where am I going to be comfortable moving after I finish grad school? Probably not to one of those 33 states, so that narrows things down a lot. Um, how am I going to have a child? I'm interested in both um, having a child biologically and adoption, so those are both options for me. If I have a child biologically, Am I gonna find a doctor who's willing to work with me, especially if I need assisted reproductive technology? Um, if I go to the hospital, is someone gonna call CPS on me? That happens all the time. Nurses and hospital staff members will call CPS on disabled parents. Um, and we'll talk more about that later as well. If I adopt, will I be able to find an agency that will work with me? Will I be told like a blind acquaintance of mine was told that I can only adopt a child who isn't too active? So. What child is that? Um, will I have to wait for 15 years, like a couple um, who are both wheelchair users who wanted to adopt um, and had to wait 15 years to be matched with a child because of questions about their disabilities? Um, maybe those things won't happen. Maybe I will be approved to foster or adopt internationally, like many of my friends were recently. Um, Maybe I'll be allowed to foster to adopt a sibling group of five like a friend was recently. Uh, maybe I'll be chosen by a birth mother um, for a private adoption like a friend was recently. So it's not all doom and gloom, but I live with daily fear um, of whether I will have this amazing opportunity to become a parent. And then I live with fear about what's gonna happen if that does happen, um, hopefully when that does happen. Um, you know, I grew up um, the only blind member in my family, you know, going outside, getting scrapes and tumbles and getting dirty, um, just playing outside with my siblings, um, being really proud when we would, you know, wear outfits that we picked out, even if they looked crazy and ridiculous, <laughs> um, giving each other terrible, ridiculous haircuts that our parents were so unhappy about. And it's cute and funny if the parents are sighted, right? But what if the parents are blind, right? Or what if the parents have another disability? All of those things could be easily grounds for someone to call CPS. And if you happen to get a discriminatory, discriminatory CPS caseworker, grounds for potential termination of parental rights. So that's really, really scary to me, and it's really scary to me to think, how do I balance, you know, avoiding the system and keeping my child with me and safe with letting my child have a normal, happy childhood that includes, you know, playing outside and sometimes not being in a perfectly matched outfit. Um, so these are all things that I think about a lot. And um, I actually put out a call last night in a couple of disability groups that I'm a part of to see kind of what other people were thinking. And I got flooded with responses. I got way more than I was expecting. And I just want to share a few snippets to let you know that this is on people's minds. So here are a couple quotes. Will people call CPS if they don't agree with me just being out with my child in public? Or what if a relationship I'm in doesn't work out and the other parent tries to use my disability as a reason why they should have full custody of the child? All of these things have happened before and I fear without laws they could happen to me. Another quote, I worry about my parental rights adopting as a queer, multiply disabled parent. Will any adoption agency consider me eligible and fit to parent? Next quote, I was really scared of getting an IUD for a long time because I was scared that if I did not like it that I would not be able to get it out on the grounds that the doctor believes disabled people should not have children. Mm. If I did have a baby, I would be too scared to give birth in a hospital. And last, I'm definitely very concerned about CPS being called based on all the horror stories I've read. I'm also worried that if I end up in a non-heterosexual presenting relationship, which is likely, I'll be under still more scrutiny. Both these things definitely influence my feelings about whether or not I want to try having children or should even hope to have children someday. So you can see the through line, right? I fear, I'm scared, I'm concerned, I'm worried. Um, lots of fear in the community about this. Um, 
and lots of fears even beyond what I have to worry about as a straight white woman for folks who are multiply marginalized, um, such as some of the people that I quoted. Go ahead. All right. So how did we get here? How did we get to a place where these children are experiencing these things? How did we get to a place where these parents and these prospective parents have to carry this level of fear and anxiety to go through every parent's nightmare um, to have to worry about things like losing your child before you even have your child, right? So we have to go back to 1914 when we really are at the height of eugenics philosophy. Eugenics philosophy can be summed up with the idea, in a nutshell, at its core, that people with disabilities should not be parents, that it was bad for society. In 1914, the Eugenics Records Office of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory issued Bulletin Number 10B, the report of the committee to study and report on the best practical means of cutting off the defective germ plasm in the American population. Really dystopian sounding, isn't it? And this was uh, written by a scholar named Henry Laughlin, who's Johns Hopkins educated. Um, in this oddly titled brief, Dr. Laughlin, who is a eugenicist, a researcher, and academic, stated that the basis of designation for sterilization is inferior potential parenthood. It included model sterilization legislation and was subsequently widely adopted. Over the course of the 20th century, it resulted in known forced sterilization of over 60,000 Americans, many as young as 10 years old. Disproportionately, they were poor and they were of color. The first person sterilized under that law was Carrie Buck, who many of you might have heard of. It was the case of Buck v. Bell. She was a, a young, poor uh, Southern teenager. She was, uh, uh, she was uh, raped and gave birth to a child. She was institutionalized, her child taken from her. And uh, it was determined that she should be sterilized because uh, three generations of imbeciles was enough. That's what the Supreme Court said. It was later determined um, that neither she nor her child uh, had intellectual disabilities. Um, this was a mix of you know, classism and uh, an overrun, over rampant uh, eugenicist philosophy. It was a good test case for the philosophy that was embodied in this model legislation. So as we all know, um, you know, government and academia work very closely together. And so you had people in government like Theodore Roosevelt and, and his circle who were very much into the idea of the Teutonic um, Superman and they were very interested in eugenics. And then you had people like Laughlin and his circle who were doing the research with state dollars and private dollars to prove it to prove they were right. So they did research and surveys like the Vermont survey where they went out and found that there were deficient families, particularly among the Abenaki, among French Canadians and the poor, um, and that you know, they were generational and that there needed to be institutionalization and sterilization. They then passed these model legislation pieces throughout the country to prevent parenthood with policies and practices of sterilization and institutionalization. So you took away both the physiological and the sociological capacity for these um, unworthy sort of race traitoring, right? Um, in the case of the whites, the race traitoring because they were failing to be Teutonic super people, and in the case of people of color, because they were already seen as fallible and, and shouldn't probably be parenting anyway, it all came together in this way of preventing them physiologically and sociologically from parenting. Then we have the rise of the Nazis, who had, at this point, found our eugenics laws to be incredibly inspiring and had adopted them and turned them into the German sanitation laws, their health laws, that they based a lot of their legal rubric and architecture for genocide upon. 
right? So they not only pulled in Jewish people and academics and labor people, but disabled people, disabled people's children, along with gypsies and everyone else that they found to be inferior. And after seeing what the eugenics, the eugenics policy writ large looked like after that fell out of favor, um, there was less ability for the American mainstream to push this concept any longer. At the same time, because of the inspiration of the civil rights movement, the disability rights movement, and the parents, um, post-World War II parents of children um, began pushing for a disassemblement of the policies and practices of forced sterilization and institutionalization. Now, forced sterilization and institutionalization did remain for Native and Black populations, particularly into the 1970s. In San Francisco, the weathermen blew up a federal building because of the forced sterilization of women of color and Native women still happening. So it's not like it went away immediately, but this is a general timeline. Um, those policies and practices begin to be disassembled. What you see next is that states begin amending their legislation to undo parenthood because now it is not bad for society but bad for kids. So you can't prevent disabled people from having children through the policy practice mechanisms of sterilization and institutionalization, but you can undo their parenthood through removals and through failing to protect and through attacks by writing in disability as a standalone grounds for the removal of children. Massive removals then begin in the state, the United States court systems in the 1980s. So where are we now? What's the state of the legislation in 2019? So as I said before, and I think this is a really important number to just keep in your mind, 33 states list disability as grounds for termination of parental rights. And of those states, only three, Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma, stipulate that it can't be the sole grounds, right? So in the remaining 30 states, it's not disability coupled with neglect or abuse. It's just the presumption that disability could lead to inferior parenting, right? So this constitutionally protective right that's been upheld by a host of Supreme Court cases is way too often negated in the case of parents with disabilities. And I'll break the numbers down for you a little bit more. So of the states that include disability as grounds for termination of parental rights, 32 make specific mention of psychiatric disability or mental illness, 30 reference intellectual or developmental disabilities, and nine list physical disabilities. Um, so psychiatric disabilities, uh, folks with psychiatric disabilities, as those numbers indicate, have extremely high levels of termination, 70 to 80 percent of the time. That is a staggering number to me. Um, folks with intellectual or de developmental disabilities, 40 to 60 percent of the time have their children removed. Um, so, you know, 50-50 chance. Um, three times, parents with disabilities are three times more likely to be involved with CPS as adults. We've got studies that show that nearly, or that's from 70 to 30 to nearly 70% of child welfare cases involved parents with disabilities. And I do think it's really important to reiterate um, that this is not because disabled folks are less capable parents. Um, numerous studies, as well as countless examples from my own life and the life of anybody who knows disabled parents, have shown that children with parents of all types of disabilities grow up happy and well cared for and successful. Studies suggest they display increased levels of empathy and emotional awareness. And adult children of parents with disabilities overwhelmingly report feeling that their parents' disabilities led to positive outcomes, including greater compassion and tolerance, awareness of disability oppression and empowerment, understanding of civil rights, enhanced resourcefulness and problem solving skills, and achieving stronger family bonds. So really, really good stuff. And there are so many people with disabilities parenting successfully. So these shocking numbers that you see up on the slide don't reflect folks with disabilities capacity to parent. They reflect unjust laws. So I want to um, just briefly highlight three cases um, that got quite a lot of media attention and that led to um, some recent positive changes. Um, so in Missouri in 2010, 
a blind couple, who I actually know personally, um, gave birth to a little baby girl, Michaela, and the mom asked for breastfeeding support, as many parents do. Um, so instead of getting breastfeeding support, a nurse called CPS on this mom, and the child was taken, Michaela mm. was taken, and placed in foster care for 57 days. Um, in Oregon, 2018, so last year, Amy Fabrini and Eric Ziegler regained custody after fighting for four years to get their sons, Christopher and Hunter, back. Four years. Um, and during those four years, they were only allowed to have brief visits, supervised visits with their sons. And some of the evidence that was brought up against their parenting capacity in court included sometimes forgetting to apply sunscreen and feeding their children chicken nuggets instead of healthier snacks. Oh so, yeah. Um, and it's important to highlight, these two cases were ultimately won in the parents with disabilities favor, but think of the trauma. Ironically, after requesting that breastfeeding support, Michaela's mother was not able to nurse her because she remained in foster care for too long, so they did not have that bonding experience. Fabrini and Ziegler missed the first four years of their eldest son's life. Um, and not all cases are one. Um, so in North Dakota, not too long ago, a woman with developmental and learning disabilities lost custody of her seven-year-old son, despite the fact that the child's father had had virtually no contact with his son prior to the custody battle. So a story very similar to the story about little Veronica that Ella told. So this is happening again and again, uh, but those three cases did lead um, to some positive change that Ella's gonna talk about now. So strategic pushback has been happening for about the last 15 years. Um, as I said, it was really the 1980s when the state, you know, the, the state, if, um, if, if there is a pushback by the people against an oppressive, um, element of state behavior, the state will reorganize itself, right? So that's what it did when it said, okay, if we can't stop you from having children, we'll take them once you have them, and amended its legislation to include disability as a grounds for removal of children. So you have to then, you, you then have to reorganize your pushback. So it, it takes time though. So in the 1980s, when they began seeing high numbers of people in the disability community losing their children, it took grassroots organizations time to figure out what to do. Um, in 2004, uh, when I was brought on to run the first you know, legal program to address this issue um, for free, so for the poor people who needed it, basically, um, we were trying to put into effect the first legislative overhaul that had been done in Idaho and in a second one in Kansas based on grassroots work by the National, um, Na uh, National Independent Living uh, Committee, NICL, um, and through organizing. So what had happened was that a grass NICL is an institution that has a national level and then a state, in every state there's a NICL, an in uh, independent living organization. And they had gone around doing listening sessions in their state in Idaho and asked, what's your biggest concern right now? People with disabilities. And they had said, they're taking our kids. We're losing our kids. And so Nickel decided that it needed a special working group on that issue and came up with one they called family, uh, fathers and mothers living independently with their young. Right? A very creative way to get family. That was a very long acronym. Um, and um, uh, they, what they did then was to put together uh, legislation that they wanted to have that would be very global and would protect parents with disabilities and their families um, in the child welfare system, probate system, which is where guardianships happen, family court system, which is where private actors argue over custody, um, and also to ensure training 
uh, for social workers and to ensure that there would be multidisciplinary teams whenever these cases in child welfare were being handled. Um, and finally, that there would be written decrees any time that a child was being, uh, having a parent was having their rights terminated to their child, um, so they would no longer have a parent-child relationship, which is what happens at the end of the child welfare process if you don't get reunified. Um, there would be a written decree if it was based on disability. So we were putting into effect the policies that, that would happen under that. And that was really the first uh, major win to get a pushback against the legislation changes that had happened in the 1980s. Um, in 2012, uh, we, had finally, we had spent four years doing research funded by the National Institute for Disability Research and Rehabilitation, um, listening to stories from the community, doing um, writing uh, model legislation and doing legal analysis of existing case law, um, collecting best practice uh, from around the world, and doing historic backstory uh, to figure out how we ended up in this situation. And we published that in Rocking the Cradle, which was a report for the National Council on Disability, uh, who advises Congress and the executive on issues to do with the disability community. Um, that, got, that garnished a great deal of media attention, um, both here and abroad, and uh, resulted in um, the Department of Justice being open to and looking for a good case where they could come and investigate this issue. Um, the Department of Justice is the entity that is mandated to implement the Americans with Disabilities Act. And under a legal concept called Chevron deference, they therefore also have the right to be deferred to on interpreting the ADA. So they can come in and say, we believe that the ADA should be applied in the following manner in cases involving parents with disabilities in the child welfare system, and that's what they did. They found a good case called the Gordon case. They came in, they investigated, and they issued a letter of findings, and they interpreted uh, the ADA to be uh, governing of child welfare cases, which people did not believe it was, even through termination of parental rights hearings, which people definitely didn't believe it was, and there was case law saying it, but it did not. So that was a huge win. By 2016, um, there were about six or seven states that were using the model legislation we included in the back of Rocking the Cradle and the publicity of the Gordon case to move this issue to some degree. Unfortunately, it's PC. It's like they'll cover one disability uh, for protection or they'll handle one court system but not another. Um, but there was movement happening. In 2017, the American Bar Association passed a resolution urging equal protection for parents with disabilities and their families for all states. This is important because what the ABA does is it says, we believe you should have language in your legislation that says something along the lines of the following. And it's considered best practice to follow that. So then legislatures across the country can be um, pressed upon uh, to adopt that language into their legislature, um, their legislative uh, body. And that's hopefully the impact that it will have is that people can bring that and say, the ABA says we should have this. We really need a bill to add this to our, our child welfare uh, language. So as Ella says, we've definitely made some progress, um, but there are limitations in the progress that we've made. Um, one is that wonderful win that Ella described, those guidelines from the Department of Justice and Health and Human Services issued in response to the Gordon case are really great and really sweeping and really impactful, except for the fact that people don't really know about them. So there's a big lack of dissemination. Um, we'll see, we'll hope that won't be the case with the ABA guidelines. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, so that's a significant problem. The other thing um, to note, the second point I wanted to make, is that people hear this number that I've been saying and repeating so often, 33 states, right? And people want to change that. They want to take out the outdated laws. But what we have learned is that that's not enough. Um, so with the case of Michaela, the little baby of the blind parents, and with the case of Fabrini and Ziegler, um, the folks who gave their kids chicken nuggets, um, those cases happened after 
the, um, or the Fabrini case happened after the DOJ guidelines. Mm -hmm. And they also happened in states where there's actually no mention of disability as grounds for termination of parental rights. So it's not enough to just take these outdated laws away. They need to be replaced with clear anti-discrimination laws. Um, that's really, really important. So on the next slide, um, I just want to talk briefly about the importance of disability leadership and cross-disability solidarity. So there's this um, slogan that some of you might be familiar with um, that is oft repeated in the disability community, nothing about us without us, which is a response to the trend of well-meaning, non-disabled folks wanting to sort of step in and help us out and save us, right? And that has happened with some of the legislation. So Washington has um, a law, and it's a good law, but it only applies to folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities, right? And why is it so limited? Because disability rights activists were not really involved in the drafting of the legislation. They weren't able to get involved until fairly late in the process, as opposed to states like Idaho and Colorado, where disability rights organizations were really spearheading um, the changes, were really involved from the get-go, and those are states that have some of the most comprehensive legislation. The other thing, and Ella alluded to this, is that we have a lot of disability-specific legislation, like the legislation in Washington, like a lot of blindness-specific legislation in Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, South Carolina, that I personally have very mixed feelings about because I appreciate it on a personal level, but why are we pinpointing one disability when these need to be universal rights, rights for everybody? Um, so this slide I want to spend a little bit more time on, talking about the exclusion of non-biological and multiply marginalized families, because I think this is really important. So adoption law is starting to be implemented here. We're starting to think about the rights of folks with disabilities who want to foster or adopt. But I think that needs to be a much more primary consideration. One story I wanted to share involves a couple who was fostering to adopt two siblings, so they were already in their home, but they were taken from their home when um, their caseworker found out that the mother was HIV positive. Um, so they fought this, they ultimately won, but really, really tragically, the day after the adoption was finalized, mm -hmm. the mother died. So they did not get to enjoy any time together as a family because of state intervention. Assisted reproductive technologies um, are actually not mentioned in any legislation anywhere about folks with disabilities being parents. Um, and this is really important because people with disabilities are getting refused um, access to these technologies. So Kiwana Chamber um, was a blind woman in Colorado in 2000 um, who garnered a fair amount of media attention when a doctor refused um, to assist her with artificial insemination and the court sided with the doctor and their big pull quote was, it was just the right thing to do. Um, so if you look at numbers, there have been surveys that have shown that very, very high percentages of doctors will not assist parents with various kinds of disabilities who need some aid in order to conceive a child. Um, and again, this is not mentioned in any current law, so this, this needs to be dealt with. Um, third point, and Ella will speak a little bit more about this in a minute, but parental mental illness is one circumstance in which the very hard-won protections of the Indian Child Welfare Act can be circumvented. We know that indigenous folks have their children taken away at incredibly high rates, that we have a history of horrific separation of native families, um, and now we are using misconceptions about disability to further that legacy, and that's something we need to address. And then finally, the question of um, dependency law, termination of parental rights related law, versus family law or custody law. A lot of the legislation that's currently out there, currently passed, currently pending, applies only to family law, right? So if you are in a custody battle, you're supported, there are laws that will 
stand behind you if your right to parent as a disabled person is challenged. But in dependency courts, often states that have amended their custody laws still continue to keep disability on the books as grounds for termination of parental rights. So who is this impacting disproportionately? Of course we know poor folks, folks of color, single parent families, the people who are disproportionately represented in the child welfare system. So that's an issue that we very much need to address. So what are the challenges um, that exist even in, in our solutions? Um, you know, we, we've written that what we really need to see to push this inclusion of protective global language for families where parents have disabilities is a model similar to what the LGBTQAA community did around marriage rights. We need a national entity that's fully staffed and funded to create coalition groups state by state intentionally engaging stakeholders and legislatures to provide research, um, access to experts, and the other things that you need to move a bill to sponsorship through bill committees, sorry, um, onto the floor and through passage and implementation, right? You need PR people, research people, um, experts uh, to testify, uh, you know, um, organizers, all of that. The problem that we've found is that the disability community has not rallied around this issue in the same way that the LGBTQAA community rallied around the marriage issue. Um, there are you know, potentially different reasons for this. Um, I think that we were caught a little bit during the period we've been working between two generations. Um, the boomer generation where there was a lot of grief, where they had either abandoned the idea of having children because of the realities and the fear, and they didn't want to touch that issue because it was painful. Another population that had lost or gone through grief and loss about it and didn't want to touch that issue because it was painful. Um, and we didn't yet have the ADA generation of age having kids at a degree that they were really taking this to town as their big issue, right? Um, that generation, the, the generation that's grown up under the ADA now, you know, maybe, maybe we can get this to um, a major central issue, but that has been a challenge in our solution for us. Um, secondly, because family rights, this idea of, you know, disability is a, uh, parenting is a right protected by the 14th Amendment, it's been called uh, the most precious, a uh, most fundamental right by the Supreme Court, can be a nonpartisan issue, but requires girding issues in distasteful terms sometimes from a social justice perspective. So, there's always been this thing of, well, disability is great because it's bipartisan, right? George Bush passed the ADA for us. Well, people fought for the ADA and George Bush signed off on it, yeah. But um, the fact is that in order to sell disability to neoconservatives, what you're basically doing is having to put it in terms of Lockean philosophy and say, patriarchal traditional family is the core unit of society and it is writ as white and Christian and straight and they protect it on those terms, right? So this comes back to what Lucy was talking about of what families are we able to protect and to what degree. Um, and so it can be very challenging from an ethical and a philosophical point to, um, to do bipartisan, especially now, where bipartisan means linking arms with people who are being um, hyper-colonialist, hyper-racist, hyper-patriarchal and oppressive in many ways. Um, working legislation into praxis, 
um, you know, give me praxis or give me death. Like, I really don't care about anything unless it does something in the world. Like, it really is irrelevant. Um, this is what is going to determine success, but it's the hardest thing. So if you, you can convince people this is great and this is wonderful, but what you really need is to be able to have global training programs for the staff that are working in courts and social welfare, and that takes money. Now, we know it can be done under DVPA. We have summer training colleges that train social workers and courts in DVPA, um, understanding domestic violence and you know everything they need to know. We know we can do this, same sort of issue, but it takes money and it takes intention and people getting on board. Um, capacity building. In the case in Georgia where the county said, we don't have this service here. We can't provide these type of best practice um, parent-child interventions. We don't have them, right? Most places don't have them, and we have to create them. Now, in Rocking the Cradle, we had excellent solutions for that. You can use certain models of piloting to build centers that bring together certain disciplines that are almost like multidisciplinary teams that can serve a region, right? So that you have occupational therapists, you have a family clinical therapists, you have people who work specifically with people with intellectual disability or mental health who have children and know the best practice interventions, measures that are non-pathologizing, etc. And you can work with them and have a lawyer there as well and they're a team that can support those families in the system. That's a lot of work and it's a lot of money and intentionality. So that's going to be the challenge and the solution. We know good solutions, but there are challenges. The necessity of following the lead in understanding tribal nations' models in a colonialist society. So some of the best models for supporting parents with disabilities are to be found in tribal nations that have taken their own, um, what they call like E4 early intervention money, they have gotten it themselves and are running their own child welfare programs. And these entities are doing different work because they are child-centric, and because our Ericksonian concepts of child development were stolen from them to begin with. Erickson went and observed the Lakota to learn the concept of child development. So the idea of that if a child's development is interrupted because a parent can't support them, because they don't have something they need, well, they understand how to work with that really well. So you have places like the Navajo Nation where they have a um, Healthy Start program that goes in and works with at-risk families where there's disability or anything else where they need some extra support, some specialized support and intervention. And they are working with and having much better outcomes than we're seeing in traditional child welfare systems. Same thing, Cherokee Nation. They have a program called Lemonade for Life that's taking basically um, adverse childhood experience, ACE, programming, but it's in a traditional, um, a traditional context. And they're turning out excellent results and preventing removals, preventing separations. You can look at something like the Klamath or um, Salish Nation doing the Canoe Healing Project. Same thing. They're looking, they can take, it's a great vehicle that you don't have to change much to support parents with disabilities because a lot of what they're dealing with is needing specialized support and attention and addressing the fact that they've been traumatized in their lives by a society that is ableist, right? And they're able to support their children well with these programs. But how do we do that at a time when our nation is in hyper-colonialism, right? That's a big question, that's a challenge. Finally, at a moment when ableism, which is essential to white supremacy, and white supremacy is ascendant, how do you get people to push through and build that bridge to looking at an area that is essentially um, anti-ableist and looking to promote non-pathology and viewing people with disabilities as having a right to occupy highly valued social roles, mothering and fathering. So these are the challenges in our solutions. Um, and the fact is, that when we, if we, and I hope we will, and I think we can, when we get these solutions in, then society will reorganize itself and find another way to challenge it, right? But this is the work. This is what you do. 
right? It's not a Hollywood movie. We don't get an apex and then like, you know, credits roll, right? We're not saving ourselves or anyone else like in the moment. Um, so, you know, the, I lay these out to show that it's complex and difficult, but you know, the work goes on and the bridge building continues. So I think that's it. Yeah. That's it for us. That's it for us. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ella and Lucy. We have about 20 minutes for question audience or um, question um, and answers or interaction with the audience. Um, so I'm happy to take the mic if, or if people want to come up and speak, that might be easier. Hi. Hi. Yeah, thank you for sharing all this information. And a lot of this I didn't uh, know before. And actually, I came in um, into uh, this workshop thinking, it was actually about something else. So this, it was all yeah, new to me. And um, I'm an aspiring educator. I want to work with uh, um, like grade school students. And I'm just curious for me, like going into that, what, what support can I provide or how can I help families with uh, parents with disabilities? Oh, like what is that, like you know, that's my role as a yeah. teacher educator. Um, there's an organization called Through the Looking Glass, and they have a free a library of materials, some of which are free to download, some of which you purchase. But um, Dr. Paul Preston, who worked there for many, many years, um, I think he's now retired, he had an entire uh, uh, like a book that was done on exactly that issue of how educators and schools can support children whose parents have disabilities. Um, and I highly recommend it. Um, a lot of it is, is you know, being cognizant that that population exists and thinking of ways that you can make your programming accessible. Um, everything from parent-teacher conferences to activities in your school spaces um, to communications home to parents. Um, as well as having representations of families in the classroom that include parents and children with disabilities um, and having conversations about, you know, any experience, lived experience you or your own family members have um, because children are looking to connect and, you know, to, to feel like their identity is shared and part and, and valued in their school community um, because it's such a huge part of their lives. They spend so much time there. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend that. It's, it's Paul Preston and um, Through the Looking Glass. Hi. Um, looking at the last thing you were saying about tribal nations models mm -hmm. um, and the idea of, um, I guess you could say, appropriating, which we already have been doing, obviously, via Ericksonian, you know, no. Um, but I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, tribal nations models in terms of, um, I grew up in New Zealand. Um, I'm Australian, but I grew mm -hmm. up in New Zealand. Um, and I have a lot of Maori rel relatives, and I've always thought that um, I've always thought that um, the 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 settler colonial nation that is um, that has usurped the land should um, the very least that you know that culture can do is include you know language you know um, some forms of ceremony you know mm -hmm. I mean like we just did ceremony when you acknowledged the land. Um, but to take it even further and to teach, you know, um, language and, and other ceremony. Um, and uh, which, of course, is what you're, what you're proposing there. It's a portion. I'm using ceremony, you know, in, in a broad sense. So, um, so I put this to my uncle, uh, a Maori uncle of mine. I said, I believe that, you know, everybody should be, like, we should be teaching this. And, uh, and he said, you know, the, the, basically he said... Are you kidding? Like the Euro, Euro, you know, the, the European kids are not our problem. You like you take care of your kids, sort of thing. Um, so I guess my question is like, how do we balance this appropriation of like what, what? I mean, how will the 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 nations that you talked about that you mentioned feel about us or you know the culture that you that we're in appropriating? The, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. is, is that something you've thought of? Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. 
So to be clear, my family is from the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, um, Third River, Free Rivers District in Oklahoma. So I come out of Indian country and uh, work with the Oakland Indian community a lot. So you know what I'm talking about and, and what I said there is the necessity of following the lead of and understanding their models, right? So their lead is to take um, the idea of holding families and make it something that's a community obligation and that you use the, the traditions and community events, um, community participation, um, the idea of families and parents together, um, not pathologizing the parents, not removing the parents from the children, but taking the parents and the children into the arms of the community much more and doing a lot more with them. Um, I think that those are the types of elements that run through these programs of saying, I see you and I see you could use a lot more support. And so, or I see you and I'm concerned you might because you've been through these experiences or because you have this element in your life where you have more challenges, either because of your poverty or because you're a teenage parent or because you have a disability. And so I'm gonna see if you want that, let me support you, right? So not even necessarily waiting till people are in a position where there's concern, but reaching out and including them if they want to be included early. Um, and looking to, to see how we can embrace and hold families together for healing. And you know, and taking and working the science side of it, what we know can be really useful. Um, for disability too, particularly, there's the added element of providing assistive technology. You know, community should be providing in this case things like um, you know, assistive technology in the form of adapted baby care equipment, um, adapted wheelchairs so people can safely carry children when they're a wheelchair user, um, adapted walkers. Um, there are all types of pieces of equipment that communities could provide in the same way that these programs provide things like um, seed bank seeds of traditional seeds and planting materials so that families can plant, right? There are things you can give that help with other elements beside parenting that will support parenting and support healing and wellness in the family. And it's far more family system oriented than pathology within the parent must be fixed, medicalized, right? So I think that's more what I meant. I think, yeah, something like, um, you know, building a canoe together would definitely not make sense maybe for like a family from the Bronx. They'd be like, why am I making a boat with my child? <laughs> like, wait, this is not particularly like useful to me. And you're right, it could really smack of, um, of usurpation or something. Um, but I think looking to them and being able to follow those leads because they're having great success um, and we're just not able to follow leads of traditional people. We seem incapable of doing that. You know, we say we want women's rights, children's rights, environmental rights, all these things, but we cannot follow the lead of Native people. We keep going, we're going to fix it all through Western science, right? And we ignore societies that have successfully done this for like thousands of years. Um, and, and it continues into this milieu as well. Um, and we need to figure out how to have more humility culturally and sit and look at what's working, even if the people don't, aren't powerful and don't look like us, you know? Thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, my name is Juliana and I'm from Kenya. So sitting here and listening to this, it's very, I, wanna, I don't know if that's the right word to say, interesting to me because back um, in the, especially in the interior parts of Africa, we kids who are different in, in any way think that the kids or parents or people in America in this developed country have it easy. You know, they have access to technology. We still, we're not talking even about um, the policies yet to be changed. I feel like the things you're dealing with are kind of high level, yeah. <laughs> high level challenges. We're still yeah. talking to about basic access to education. We don't have the brain. We, they cannot go to school. Uh, there are very, very few schools that provide, and if they're there, they're expensive. So we, we're still dealing with, with basic needs first. How, we don't have 
wheelchair access. We don't even have the wheelchair. Some of them don't even have the wheelchair. So we're still, <laughs> we're still there, but you're doing a good job and we hope to get here one day that we are dealing with this. We, they don't have, we don't have children being taken away. It's not that much there because who's going to take them and when, where are they going to go because of yeah. the level of poverty? Yeah. So if anything, people are trying to run away and deal with that situation. And for me, what um, I, I, the message I would like to pass uh, is that if you, the, it's, it's all, it all goes back to the society and to how you respond or how you want to relate. And if you're different in any way, you have to be really, really, really open-minded. Because sometimes somebody's trying to be nice or be good, but it is offensive to you in a way, you know? Maybe the language that they use or, or how they approach you or how, or sometimes they don't even know how to communicate. I would love to have a story and have a girl time with, uh, uh, with a, a young person with disability who is my age, but I don't know, I can't. I, we won't understand each other somehow. So we, don't, we, we ourselves don't even, are not capacity built or have the knowledge or a way to, you can teach yourself, but it's not accessible. You really have to work hard to, to have access to the communication and everything. So we also need help as you, I know it's a lot to advocate for what you need because uh, it's your challenges, but the community too need to get involved. They how they as we put these laws and, and, and access for people with disability, we need to see how we integrate everybody in the community too in this process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know. Yeah. Question. <laughs> Can I just maybe make one quick comment? I really appreciate that comment. Um, I think it's really worth thinking about how this aspect of American culture is perceived in other parts of the world. So I appreciate your comment um, about how things are in Kenya and the fact that um, parent-child separations is not really a problem there. And certainly there are many other issues that need to be dealt with. Um, and I had wanted to say earlier, um, and I'm glad I have a chance now to say, that I was recently listening to a really, really wonderful um, radio series um, coming out of Australia. It's called We've Got This, Parenting with a Disability. I think I'm getting that right. If you want to look it up, it's really great. Um, but over and over, people kept saying, I was really scared to have a child, or I was really scared to do this certain thing with my child because of the horror stories coming from America. Mm. So as much as we might be perceived as sort of further along in some places of the world, we are also perceived as a disturbing and <laughs> terrifying example of so many things, including this aspect of um, parent-child separations due to disability. Yeah, and, and I mean, we, we have to keep in mind too that at any given moment, about 500,000 kids are in foster care systems. Yes. So that means, you know, on average, you know, if you, if you want to think, okay, maybe just, just to be general, say maybe that's 350,000 families, all right, because there are multiple kids and families sometimes. So 350,000 families. A majority of those cases are poverty cases, right? This is the richest country in the world. We could literally just give those people enough money and cut that number probably in half, if not two thirds. We could do private occupational therapists, adaptive equipment, therapists, personal attendants, get the 30 to 60% that are based, you know, that are disability related supports they need. And we probably don't even need to have a child welfare structure to the degree that we do because we have such a limited problem really. 500,000, that's nothing. This is a nation of 365 million people, right? And we've got less, we've got half a million, less than half a million families. Right? There's, there's an issue here too with the idea that there's a huge investment in having a large architecture, right? That is focused on a very small group of people, right? And I have found that in the 12 to 15 years of doing work, that the only people that ever show up to challenge the legislative changes we try to make 
are the child welfare people. Mm -hmm. It's the child welfare system. Now, I have a degree in social welfare. I don't think child welfare people wake up every day and go, I'm going to ruin kids' lives. That's not what I'm saying. They're not evil or bad. But there's a real strong investment in the concept that we need this extremely large architecture of a benevolent system that most people will agree, um, you know, a lot of this could just be solved with more money to families um, and that most of this is poverty driven. And so we also do have to look at that of like, you know, why is it that as this hugely rich nation with so many resources, can this, what really is essentially um, a very limited problem as far as the numbers, can't, can't be fixed or hasn't been fixed. I know, que bono, who benefits? I think it's worth considering as well. Hi, I was wondering, um, I don't know if you're, um, are you, just to make sure, are you all in California? Mm -hmm. Okay, I knew some were connected. Um, so as, as a voter and like a, a person living in Alameda County, um, do you have some like tangible things coming up? Like, oh, there's a measure that we want support for to make sure it gets on the ballot in the next election. Or um, there's this organizing committee you could join or donate to. Um, so what, um, uh, I was just wondering if you have any kind of specific recommendations that um, voters and participants in society can take part in. Oh, that's a great, great question. It's all in there? That's a great question. Okay. <laughs> um, I will say that, that my work has, was national um, on this issue because I was funded by the federal government and it, it had to be national, my mandate. Um, California is a very hard place to do this work. Our legislators can only sponsor three bills a year. Mm -hmm. And if you think you're going to get ahead of like Earth Justice, good luck. <laughs> you know? It's really hard. It's really, really hard in California. Um, that's why you see a lot of small states, smaller states than like New York and California um, or Illinois or something have made uh, often bigger jumps. Um, so there's nothing particular happening right now in California that I'm aware of, but there are great groups. Um, the Bay Area Collaborative on American Indian Resources in Oakland is an excellent group, and I highly suggest anyone check it out if they're interested in, in donating money or um, energy or time. Um, and Lucy, I don't know if you have... Yeah, I'm also not aware of any ballot measures or other initiatives. We're working on it, but not, not there yet. Um, on the national level also, um, I think the most active organizations right now disseminating information about parents with disabilities and their rights are going to be the Disabled Parenting Project and Center for the Rights of Parents with Disabilities. Um, so they tend to share, you know, if, if there's something coming up that voters need to think about, um, if there's, you know, a horrible case that needs to be sort of commented on. Um, publicly, so that those would be two pages, um, or two organizations, I say pages because I follow them on Facebook, but two organizations to follow, Disabled Parenting Project and Center for the Rights of Parents with Disabilities. And then um, Representative Jim Langevin of Rhode Island, who's uh, one of the members of the Congressional Caucus on Foster Youth and Their Families, is um, he is hoping to do something at the federal level on this issue. Um, I have been providing his staff with information, key documents, um, but they're, they're at a really early point. Um, but nothing's been tried at the federal level for obvious reasons. It's really difficult with the Senate, and it has been for a long time. We haven't held both houses, um, I mean, you know, the left hasn't held both houses in a really long time, so it's, it's quite difficult um, to get things through. And because there were amendments to the ADA in 2010, an amendment on the ADA um, was seen as unlikely. But you know, time's passed now. It's been almost 10 years. So um, I think they feel that there's more of a likelihood than there was a few years ago. So he's um, probably the uh, most likely suspect to do anything at this point at the federal level. So, so thank you. I think you know, one of the takeaway points is the importance of coalition building, the weaponizing of uh, child protective services that you talk about. Um, in the case of disability, is um, strongly intersectional with poverty and with race. Um, um, and so we need to figure out how to build better coalitions. Um, I think many of us who are working on uh, parental issues or on the question of eugenics um, in the 21st century have similar concerns, but we're coming at it from very different points. And so mm -hmm. to the degree that conferences such as this can help bring us together, I think it's, it's really important. Um, 
I want to thank all of you for, for coming today. Um, um, I want to thank our Ella mm -hmm. and Lucy and our invisible third panelist, uh, <laughs> Sue Schweik, yeah. for coming. And I hope you um, all have a, a really wonderful conference for the rest of the day, today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so thank, thank you. you. Thank you.